In terms of changing your mind, I really love this phrase from the Buddha that it is valuable to develop a mind that is malleable and wieldy. Malleable is kind of a fancy translation of the idea that it can learn, it can grow, it can budge, it can adapt to new information, new situations, new priorities, and a mind that is wieldy that we can use for the sake of relieving suffering in others and ourselves and use for the sake of promoting the highest happiness uh, and the welfare of all beings. So malleable and wieldy, that's kind of an overarching theme. Um, I've got some notes here, so you'll see me look down from time to time. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm doing when I'm looking down. So as a kind of introduction, no doubt, it's important to have certain views, to um, be discerning and to stand up for what you see out there in the world um, and inside your own self and to be able to make use of it. This is especially important uh, if you're somebody who has been gaslighted by various people ranging from your family of origin and your peers as a kid uh, all the way up to the world in which you live today. Uh, it's especially important to have the self-respect that, that honors what you see and what you know and what you value and what you plan. Uh, also, if you've been kind of pushed around by the views of other people or had other people attack what you know and what you see uh, or undermine it or dismiss it or you know, make you doubt yourself. Uh, also, if you're somebody who tends to second guess yourself, second guess yourself a ton, you know, if you're um, dealing with the hindrance of doubt, as the Buddha talked about, in ways that are problematic, you know, it's it's important to not endlessly doubt yourself, um, endlessly get lost in the paralysis of analysis. Um, so that's that's really important. I want to acknowledge that up front. Second up front, it's natural to have views. I'm using that term really broadly here. It's natural to have beliefs, to form categories, to have expectations, to have assumptions, to kind of simplify your view of other people, yourself in the world uh, in various ways. This is useful. So we don't have to keep reinventing, uh, you know, the way we think about things or, you know, what we believe is true uh, every time, you know, we wake up in the morning or with every breath we take. You know, there's a place for that. On the other hand, you know, we can get trapped in our views. We can get stuck in them. We can get into trouble if we're rigid about asserting them with other people. We can become very reactive to the views of others. Uh, as the Buddha pointed out, um, you know, we can become attached to our views as one of the four primary objects of attachment that leads to suffering. The others being attachment to maintaining pleasure and avoiding pain uh, and attachment to routines, rituals, procedures, ways of conducting ourselves, getting stuck in our habits, and fourth and last, getting attached to ourselves and taking things oh so personally. So attachment to views is identified certainly in Buddhism as one of the main sources of suffering. And also um, in psychology, there are a number of uh, very interesting ways that have been identified that people, different kinds of beliefs that we can get stuck in and different ways of understanding why. So as I go into this material, first, I wanna say that it's okay, as I began tonight talking about, it's okay to see what I'm talking about in other people. Sometimes it's easier to see that in other people, uh, whether it's scaled up at people in the news or all the way down to the people you grew up with or work with today or you know, eat dinner with across the table. It's easier to see it in them often. But as much as you can, keep bringing it back to yourself because that's where you actually have influence and that's um, what affects you the most for better or worse as you go through your day. Okay, so in psychology, numerous sorts of views have been identified that we can get stuck with. For one, we can get stuck in our attributions of intentions or qualities of being or attitudes in other people. 
In other words, we can have the view, the belief, even sort of unconsciously, that they're doing it on purpose, or they're out to get us, or they don't really respect us, or uh, they're trying to dominate us or stick us under their thumb. And maybe that view is correct. Maybe they really are out to get you. Uh, on the other hand, often in the famous uh, sort of parable of the log from the Taoist tradition, the truth is they're not particularly out to get us. We are, for better or worse, kind of a bit player in their own personal mental dramas as they go through life. They don't care that much, actually. Uh, maybe there's a passing attitude of anger or irritation toward us, but you know, uh, they're not really out to get us so much. Or they're not really a bad person. They may do certain kinds of things, but other parts of them and in other ways and in other relationships, they really are kind and good and sweet and forbearing and virtuous with other people. So we can be aware of attributions. That's the term that's used of qualities we attribute to other people uh, rightly and often wrongly. A second kind of view that we can get stuck in are models or paradigms of relationships, that it's a certain kind of relationship and a kind of role in that relationship that we can get stuck in. We can feel like we've got to stay inside that frame, or we can just unconsciously or semi-consciously have paradigms of relationship, such as in terms of insecure attachment, in which we view people today as not as reliable or not as uh, worthy of relationship as they may actually be. We might actually underestimate people in our life today because we're projecting onto them. We're writing them into a familiar script from our childhood or the high school we went to. We're writing them into that those roles and we're looking at them through the lens of that script when in fact, it's not actually true for them or it needn't, there's more flexibility. They needn't be so rigidly like that as we view them to be. So the, the technical term in psychodynamic psychotherapy is object relations. The idea that there's the sense of oneself and then there's the sense of objects, other people or groups of people you know, in the world. So that's another kind of um, way of looking at things that we can get stuck in are assumptions about relationships and the frames in which we think we have to function in our relationships. A third is our self-concept. Who do you think you are? How do you regard yourself? And this can have very far-reaching implications. There's a lot of research on that. Do we regard ourselves as, as weaker or broken or defective or wrong or tainted in some way? Um, do we regard ourselves as just incapable of continually prone to messing up? Do we regard ourselves as someone that is you know, not that worthy or le is, some, is less than others? Uh, I certainly have grappled with that. Um, one form of that for me was that as I grew up uh, young going through school uh, for different reasons, including skipping a grade and having a late birthday, and just by my kind of nature as a sort of studious, cautious, anxious kid, um, I didn't think of myself as very athletic at all. And nor did I think of myself as someone who was gonna do battle with the alphas, the alpha boys and girls around me, especially boys. And so I kind of acquired a sense of myself as kind of wimpy. Ugh. But then actually midway in my 20s, there was this whole moment where it was kind of like the movie of my childhood just flashed before my eyes. And I saw episode after episode after episode in which in my settings, in terms of what was actually available to me, I was pretty tough. I stood up for myself. I, I, I did not let myself be pushed around in certain ways. I mean, I would exit sometimes, but you know, I was definitely a nerd. I was president of the dork club, but I was not a wimp. So that was a shift in self-concept. And sometimes we can have other kinds of shifts as well, including related sometimes, if we've been um, painted into a certain way of being due to cultural or gender-rooted socialization that as a fill-in-the-blank, 
as a man, as a woman, as someone who transcends those gender categories, as someone who's straight, as someone who's gay, as someone who's black, as someone who's white, you know, we can feel like our self-concept um, has been painted onto us in a sense by other people, or including mm -hmm. the culture broadly. And that can be very trapping. That can be very limiting. And there can be a real process in which we kind of expand our sense of ourselves, you know, to, and become freer. Uh, of um, the views that are embedded in our self-concept. Fourth, uh, the odds of a dreaded experience. We form expectations about the future based on our history. And if in our history, you know, when bad things routinely happen, like when we spoke up or pushed against the power structure, we were really smacked down. Well, we're gonna form an expectation that the odds are high that if we speak up today, that dreaded experience is going to happen again. And yet the, expect the odds of it happening today often are a lot less than the likelihood of it happening when we were younger or in our early jobs or in an early relationship. So we can be attached in a sense. We can be kind of stuck in the uh, just automatic belief that the likelihood of a bad event and the, therefore the likelihood of a dreaded experience is really high today, but in ways that are actually not so true, okay? And then uh, a last, a fifth uh, common way in which we can kind of get stuck in views is the meanings we give to events, the spin we put on them or the perspective we have about them or the kind of frame of reference we drop them into. Um, and sometimes those meanings are accurate but often they're not necessarily accurate. Uh, for example, if another person um, kind of pauses when we say something and then asks us a question, maybe the meaning we give to that is that they think what we said was stupid and in a polite way, that's actually kind of condescending. They're trying to help us understand the error of our ways. That might be a meaning we put on it based on our own upbringing, our own experiences with people maybe in workplace environments. And yet actually maybe that's not their meaning at all. Maybe for them, they just missed a word. <laughs> you know, They didn't quite hear it. Uh, and innocently or neutrally, they're trying to understand. So the kind of meanings we give to things. All right, so these are some of the five major ways that I've listed here that we can get um, kind of stuck in different views my notes, identified in psychology, to repeat the attributions we give to other people of qualities or intentions inside them, models or paradigms of relationships, second, and our roles inside those frames that we get rid into, third, self-concept, fourth, the odds of a dreaded experience, and fifth, the meanings or interpretations we give to events or to the actions of others. There are others in this, you might think of everyday examples, but these are kind of five major categories, well known in psychology. And then psychology has also identified factors that keep us stuck, such as one, the discomfort of what's called cognitive dissonance. We believe X, but the world is saying Y, Arr, tilt, tilt, tilt. Or we look at someone and we know that in some ways they're kind of a jerk, but over here, they're really being nice and helpful. What, uh, how do we put those two together? It's, it's hard actually to be ambivalent. We tend to split in the language of psychology or, you know, and kind of see people as, you know, all saint or all sinner, right? But rather than see them in complex and ambivalent sorts of ways. Okay, so it's uncomfortable to hold opposing ideas in the mind. I think F. Scott Fitzgerald has some line like the capacity to hold two or more opposing ideas in the mind at once is a real mark of, of intelligence in the broadest sense. So cog the, the discomfort of cognitive dissonance tends to make it harder to change your mind. Second, uh, Piaget, great Swiss child psychologist, identified two ways of learning, two modes of learning. And the more challenging of the two is to accommodate our familiar structures of worldview to incoming information that challenges it and to actually budge, to kind of shift, to accommodate. That's harder 
that's cognitively much more challenging than, as he put it, assimilating incoming information, even if it doesn't really fit, and slotting it into a familiar worldview without actually changing that worldview at all. And as a result of that, not always seeing things accurately as we kind of force them into a familiar framework. So the challenge of accommodation cognitively, it's scary for people to shift their worldview. Third uh, factor that tends to keep our views in place is the fact that they're often acquired in childhood, early childhood even. So they're kind of preconceptual and even preverbal. And sometimes they're associated with traumatic material that makes it even harder to access them as conclusions we formed or expectations we formed about certain kinds of people like authority figures or tall people or people who talk fast or people who maybe for very you know legitimate uh, just honorable reasons would enjoy more of a romantic or physical relationship with us uh, that could feel like an anathema to us understandably because maybe that was taken advantage of previously in our life so that's another factor that tends to hold our views in place the third that they're often acquired when we're young and then fourth, uh, the familiar negativity bias, uh, the brain's uh, you know, baked in design that makes it like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones, that makes it, tends to make us overlearn from and overgeneralize from painful, stressful experiences and eh, you know, acknowledge, but then kind of ignore generally uh, positive experiences. So these are four factors that tend to uh, keep um, our views in place, notably the discomfort of cognitive dissonance, the challenge of accommodating and shifting our worldviews to new information that challenges it. Third, uh, the fact that many of our key and very far reaching beliefs, expectations, sense of self, sense of the world are acquired in childhood. Uh, sometimes associated with trauma. And then fourth, the brain's just hardwired design is negativity bias. It tends to overlearn from and over hold on, hold on to uh, uh, you know, what we learn and what we believe from painful negative experiences. And you could probably think of lots of everyday examples of what I'm talking about here. Why is it so hard to budge, right? Why does it seem so remarkable when a person um, shifts their view. There's a kind of a quotation that's attributed to uh, Maynard Keynes, the great economist. Actually, it's not really what he said, but it's attributed to him, but the quotation stands in its own right. And I, so I imagine in this fantasy world of mine that Keynes is sitting at some posh London, you know, ritzy dinner table and people are sitting around, you know, hooing and hawing and he looks at someone and he says, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? So it has that feeling. It's hard for people to do that. And we think it's really quite remarkable. Okay. So um, what can we do? That's what I'm going to talk about now and then open it up for discussion, nightmare scenarios. And I want to really stress, this is about changing your mind. I know how tempting it is to want to change their mind, whether it's politically or just about how the right way to do the dishes or walk the dog, right? But I'm going to focus here on changing your mind. So what can we do? I'm going to just go through a number of things we can do. Any one of them is good. The more, the better. I'm working on it myself. First, a general attitude of openness. Openness to information, openness to new experiences, openness to new people, new ways of doing things, just openness, trying new things. That can be really helpful. Um, you know, you can kind of stretch your openness by deliberately just watching new programs on, in YouTube or on television, trying out new things, trying out new meals, deliberately changing habit patterns, uh, driving in different ways, um, you know, being kind of curious about people who come from different backgrounds, 
uh, just a general attitude of openness. And there are things that can help us be open. We can grow inner resources that support openness, like being able to calm yourself. And another one is to remind yourself that ultimately you get to decide what you're going to believe. You ultimately get to decide who you are going to become, which then meanwhile, as you ground in the knowledge of your own autonomy can help you be more open to inputs and even influences by others. I think this uh, quotation from Rilke, what a wonderful German writer and poet, Rilke, um, Reiner Maria Rilke, I think. He wrote, perhaps everything that frightens us is in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. Something really quite deep about that, whether it's what frightens us inside us that we fear would be stirred up if we actually open to something coming in or something that frightens us in another person or out in the world. Again, Rilke, perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. So, openness. Second, enjoy changing your mind. Look for changing your mind as a value, kind of honor it, admire it, uh, respect yourself for having the courage to cast loose from the familiar moorings of known beliefs, going out into the deeper waters of the unknown. Uh, you know, value yourself, pat yourself on the back. Good on you. Openness. You changed your mind. Um, you know, it's noble to learn and to grow and to budge. It's uncommon, isn't it? Um, you know, you can value seeing that you were wrong. Uh, for myself, there was a shift. I grew up in quite a fault-finding home. My parents, uh, you know, were well-intended. They, they sought the safety grounded in their experience in the Great Depression in America in the 1930s. You know, they sought the safety of, you know, really identifying anything that was wrong to make sure that nothing bad would ever happen. Whoa. Um, you know, so ugh, I hated being wrong. And I, in my 20s, I kind of learned to enjoy being wrong. And I reframed it as the prelude to being right. <laughs> I like being right, probably have noticed. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of noble. Okay, I'm, I'm wrong. The recognition of how I was wrong about that. Okay, good. It's on the path to becoming more knowledgeable not just righteously right, but just in a virtuous sense, more knowledgeable, more grounded in reality, clearer in my view, less ignorant, more competent, more skillful, grounded in seeing what's true. So being wrong is a, just the prelude. Recognizing how you were wrong is a wonderful prelude to the value of becoming more knowledgeable and capable. Uh, an attitude of playfulness, an attitude of even playing with your own mind, being playful inside your own mind, getting some room to breathe with familiar beliefs, uh, that too will foster um, the capacity to change your mind. Another one is the classic attitude of don't know mind. I worked for a mathematician for a year in my 20s, one of my most interesting jobs, and we we're doing risk analyses, probabilistic risk analyses of all kinds of complicated things. Uh, and he said, Rick, a real mathematician is someone who wakes up in the morning and asks, what is a number actually? <laughs> it's don't know mind. It's not duh mind. Don't know mind is really valued, I believe, in the Korean Zen tradition. Um, you know, it's the attitude of, huh, don't know. Don't know. Uh, I had a, a friend and teacher, uh, Musang, from the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies, who said that his practice a lot was releasing all expectations of literally what the next moment would be. I mean, even just taking a step, releasing the expectation that the ground would be there to meet it. It might be, we hope, but don't know. Don't know. Don't know. So don't know mind. Also, this is a very important one and a deep one. Recognize the emptiness of all views. What do I mean by that? A view is an idea, it's a belief. And if you look closely at any mental contents of any kind, they're all, they all have three characteristics identified by the Buddha. They're impermanent, they're compounded, and they're dependently, they're interdependent. Therefore, because they're, all, they're dynamic, they're kind of wiggly, they're vibrating, they're made of parts, and they're kind of nested in a vast network of other causes, other factors, they lacked absolute self 
existence. They lack solidity. They lack ownership. They're there emptily. And when we start to regard the opinions, the beliefs, the ideas of ourselves or even others as more like clouds, more insubstantial, once so solid, we start to unpack them, we disentangle them, less like knots in the fabric of reality and more like gauzy, foamy fabric or clouds, then they're not so oppressive. They're not so thing-like. And we don't try to grab them because then they're things we can hold on to or push away. We don't feel so oppressed by them. And we can have more of an attitude of curiosity and exploration and non-attachment as we um, engage views. This is really valuable, central to Buddhist practice um, as a path of awakening, the deepening felt real-time recognition of the emptiness of all experiences and almost all aspects of physical reality, recognizing the emptiness of views. Very good. Okay, another, be mindful of your own anger or anxiety that you know, get you to really identify with or hold on to um, different views, different beliefs, different ideas, or resist changing your mind, uh, different kinds. Sometimes our beliefs function as like a metallic lid on top of a lot of raw feelings. So the function of that rigidity of belief is to keep those feelings at bay. So if we wanna release or soften, melt, some of that mm, rigidity that's like walking around in a suit of armor that's three sizes too small, a path into that is to resource yourself so that you can then gradually open bit by bit, maybe one spoonful of tears at a time, um, opening to that bucket there of raw feeling. Um, and then on the basis of releasing that, then there can be less rigidity and righteousness um, of view. Right. Self-righteousness and being aware of that is like a flag. That's like a big red light inside your inner dashboard. Self-righteousness, the feeling of that in your body, the leaning in, like what does your body do when you're getting self-righteous? Uh, I'm very, you know, I know what my body <laughs> can do, what it's like. And, as soon as your body goes into that mode, as soon as your mind starts moving in that direction, banging on your case, developing your case at others, moving into that prosecutor mode, you know, um, with this implicit sense of, you know, superiority somehow. I know and you don't. I'm right and you're wrong. I'm better and you're worse. Um, I'm good and you're bad. I'm smart and you're not. Um, blah, 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 blah. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Boy, is that a red flag? That's a warning bell flashing inside. Okay, a couple more and then I'll open it up to you. Uh, let the message get through when there's something to change, when there's something to shift. Let it land, like let it sink in. Maybe 1% of you knows it's true, darn. 99% of, you, of you is really irritated that they actually are right. I know what that's like. Well, help that 1% grow. Take your stand more and more in it. Disengage more and more from, you know, that old way of seeing things so that instead of it being 1%, 99%, starts moving like 20% of you is, is taking your stand in this new way of looking at things, which does mean that you were wrong in some way or you do need to change your mind in some way. And then increasingly, you know, the, there's a momentum shift. There's a tipping point. A center of gravity starts moving over into this new way of looking at things. And then over time it becomes 99.1 and then 100.0, which you really have internalized this new way of looking at things. Let it land. Um, let yourself uh, be changed. Be willing to be changed. Be brave enough to become a little new each day. Okay. Willingness to budge. What's the feeling of budging? Even if there's a certain <laughs> grudging budging, <laughs> a certain resistance to budging. Okay, okay, okay. It's still your budging. It's good. It's good. Pat on the back. You are budging. <laughs> You're budging. Uh, valuing that, appreciating that, willingness to do that. Let's see. Here's one too. You are not your views. 
one thing that supports this budging, this shifting process, is to disidentify from views, to realize that there are views, I have views, but that's not I am my views. Getting some daylight, getting some air between you and opinions, um, what you think is true, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not you. So that if you change your views or you realize you're wrong, it's not like, oh, in the core of my being, I'm flawed. No, what you thought was flawed, but deep in your being, you're a conscious, open, moral person who's trying to learn and grow every day, which means changing your mind sometimes. And when, you know, here's another one, try it out. Run little experiments about the new way of looking at things. Little experiments, small steps, small risks, you know, and then let reality be your jury, right? Let's see how it turns out. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I wasn't. Let's see. Let's try something. That's especially useful about the odds of a dreaded experience. It's especially useful about um, our own self-concept. Try it out. You know, that's a, that's a way to really help yourself budge in very small ways. And then, you know, internalize the results of the experiment. Do this for your reasons. You're not succumbing to others. You're not submitting to them. You're not placating them. You're not being pushed around. You autonomously are changing your mind because it's your mind and you're the boss of your mind fundamentally and you're a want, you are wanting to change it. And then last, when talking with others, you know, you can communicate your view like an offering. You're placing it out there with some clarity, hopefully with some skill, but what they do with your view is their business. It's not necessarily your business. And you don't have to keep chasing what's happening in the black box of their mind to try to plug the module of your view into their motherboard, getting their bad view out so you can get your good view in. Uh, man, there's not much cheese down that tunnel. And I've gone down that tunnel many times. Uh, beware of pressing your point and see what it's like to inquire without an agenda even, to be curious about their views, to have curiosity without a critique. Um, that can really be helpful when exploring the views of others. And then last, I absolutely wanna make this point offered last night by our brilliant daughter. Imagine what it's like to be a cat, a cat or a dog. We have a cat or a cat as us um, without views. How peaceful, how much in the present, how unburdened and unafflicted uh, it is to be a cat. <laughs> a dog uh, without being attached to views. Wonderful. Okay, so lots here. Um, comments, questions. What do you think? Let me see, I'm looking at the chat, just seeing if there's anything here. Um, let's see, I'm gonna scoot up to see if there's a comment up here. Dave. Hmm. I'm not seeing comment or questions in the chat. This is great. I'm just seeing a lot of comments, but this is great. So it's not so much a thing. Um, and I know that David 1030 M. Okay, M. Here we go. 713. Um, okay, great. I want to comment on M's comment. If you go up to 713 PM or whatever the 13 is, M writes to everyone, at times when I'm stuck, there is also a physiological event that accompanies it. Right on. Very good noticing too, by the way. Lack of sleep, skipping a meal or meals, depriving the brain or body of its nutrients. Completely true. So I, I should have named that. Thank you, Am. Thank you, Dave, for pointing to that. Um, you know, support the vehicle, right? Uh, there's this uh, line in, I think, Alcoholics Anonymous, HALT, H-A-L-T. It's a nice acronym. You know, be careful when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And so supporting the body so it's not hungry or angry or lonely or tired then can help us have more flexibility. I know that when I'm 
well-fed, well-rested, feeling happy, I'm a lot more mentally flexible. If I'm weary, tired, cranky, you know, I feel hurt, wounded by life. <laughs> I'm a lot less gracious and generous when people have a different idea. Okay, good, excellent point. I see two hands, I'm gonna call on two people. So I'm gonna call on iPhone USA B and then Elizabeth. Okay, so iPhone USA B, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I see a hand up. iPhone USA B, unmute, no? Okay, how about Elizabeth? Where, where's Elizabeth? Anybody have a hand up here? No? So I'm not seeing anyone with a hand up. George Klein has a question in the chat. There you are, George. Okay, great. Can you unmute yourself? Great. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'm curious in if I'm around people, which we all are, people that are very righteous or set in their ways, if there's any points of view, uh, frame of mind I or others can have uh, that help look at that. Like you could look at it with compassion or say, oh, isn't that funny how, uh, you know, I could stay open to it too, but sometimes they're just, people can be just dead right or wrong. Um, yeah. I just wondered about some approaches that we can take on mindfully that are mm -hmm. beneficial to ourselves. Yeah, well, I, I'll begin with and end with um, changing our own mind in, about their minds, in effect. So the question then becomes, how do we see them? What do we think about them? Uh, what are the cognitions that underlie our reactions to them? Like, um, you know, we could, we could be offended by what they think, or we could see that uh, we could believe that what they're doing is uh, morally problematic. I mean, for example, just to, Use an obvious example, Texas is dealing with enormous winter storm and the governor of Texas, Abbott, is blaming windmills for the power outages, even though windmills amount to 7% of Texas's power. And so we can have an opinion about that as I do, that that sort of uh, right-wing spin uh, is aiding and abetting a lot of problems. All right, so that's an opinion. So we can have all kinds, so we have all kinds of reactions to things. I'm not, you know, others might disagree about that, but I'm describing myself. So then the question becomes, can we simply accept how we see it after we evaluate it? Is it actually true? Yeah, they are that, they are doing that right now. I see that. And then can we be, can we be at peace with our own view rather than feeling like we have to change them? That's something I think is really useful, right? And then another thing I think is useful is to just be very attentive to qualities of superiority or righteousness in ourselves, in relationship to the thoughts of others. And to just be, to realize we don't need to adopt that attitude, even if in our discernment, we think their thoughts are inaccurate or incomplete or morally problematic. And then also, do we feel that we're somehow implicated in the opinions or beliefs of others that so we have to change them? And often we realize, no, it's unfortunate that they think that way, but we're not entangled with it. You know? Yeah, I get that they think that way and they vote and that has effects and I am powerless to change it. And really, really strong people have tried to change that uh, and just, haven't succeeded and I'm not gonna be able to do that myself. And so I'm gonna focus over here. These are all things that we can do ourselves uh, with, with the opinions of others, whatever they may be. And um, I think there's just a wisdom, a classic wisdom and we make our offering, you know, the Buddha had a teaching that I've thought about a lot these days. There's no wisdom in arguing with a fool as he put it. And many people came to him and there's a good record, whether it was philosophical or just eccentric, 
these eccentric characters in the spiritual world of India 2,500 years ago or these highfalutin Brahmins that are going to take down the big Buddha, right? And he just said, you know, and for me, a lot, it's about good faith. What, what do we, where's that other person coming from? Are they open to changing their mind? Are they speaking in good faith? Are they fundamentally committed to principles of telling the truth and playing fair? That principles cut both ways, right? If it's bad when our team does it, well, it's bad when their team does it too, for example. And if they're not, and often you realize they're not there, they're, are they in a quest for truth? You know, or are they in a quest just to bang on their opinion? And, you know, you start to realize that a lot of people, they're not there as a quest for truth. You're there for a quest for truth, but they're not. And it's asymmetrical. <laughs> and you can get really pushed around by or waste a lot of time with people in which you're open to their inputs and they have zero openness to yours. So I think that's, that's useful too. And to be straight about it. And to know, even if it's not safe to name it with them, uh, you know, you can name it inside your own mind or even to other people. And sometimes it's like, you just name it to them. Like you're not here in good faith. You are prepared to lie and you're not willing to admit that you lied. You're spinning all over the place to avoid admitting that you lied. You are not a trustworthy, credible person to speak with. You're not worth my time. Shame on you. I'm out of here. You know, and personally, I think there's a place for punishing freeloaders, including social freeloaders for the sake of their greater good. There's a lot of evolutionary psychology about that. You know, altruistic punishment sometimes it's called where we just call it for the sake of the group. And we're not gonna um, get any satisfaction. They're not gonna change with us, but for the sake of the greater whole, we call it. And I think there's a place for that. We have to be aware of the pitfalls of righteousness and selfing and you know, counterproductive naming and shaming, but I think there's a point for um, calling out the bully. Uh, the Buddha talked about, I see you, Mara. The emperor has no clothes. I think there's a place for that. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, Jack Zaphos, I might go a little long tonight. If you want to leave early, you're, you're welcome to. I think this is very rich material. I mean, long, like four more minutes. Okay, Jack Zaphos. Yeah, uh, I was in a situation recently where I had a bit of a change of mind, where I uh, I had succumbed to a scam, and today I realized that this was in fact a scam, as I mm. was able to find evidence uh, on something. It was a uh, uh, a it was a tech support group that were uh, it sold me a uh, bill of goods, and I because I am not that experienced with that kind of thing, I kind of trusted them. Yeah. And today, you know, uh, well, today I got a little enlightened. I saw what they were, did a little research, and it kind of got testy this afternoon. So I guess the question is, what, how is it best to handle these kind of situations where you know, there's a situation where, you know, uh, for the greater good to really, you know, come hard on these people, uh, but also, you know, to make sure that I, uh, you know, I'm not, that I'm not in, in uh, going to be damaged in any way. Yeah. And also, you know, assert my rights. Very good. So, again, we could take this into how can we convince them that they were bad, wrong, you know, unbusinesslike. And that's, that's a conversation. Maybe there's a little place for that. But I'm going to keep returning it to, okay, what do we do with our own view? And one thing that I'll just offer here that I've been very aware of in myself <clears throat> is a kind of childlike, innocent quality that tends to be trusting. I can see it in your face there, Jack, <laughs> this kind of sweet quality. And like, you can hardly believe that some people are like that. You're like, well, <laughs> really? Uh, and there's something in us sometimes that can be kind of very childlike and innocent, or, or maybe we, you know, kind of trusting. And there needs to be a bit of a change of mind where we begin to realize that not everybody's operating by that playbook and there'll be dragons out there and there'll be freeloaders, there'll be bullies, there'll be ripoff artists, there'll be people with situational ethics. They, there'll be the, in the title of the book, the sociopath next door. Uh, mm. And you can realize too that people are often compartmentalized. In one compartment, they would 
you know, rush into the street to pull a child back from a non-rushing bus who's not their own kid, but in another compartment, they would happily sell the parent of that kid some bogus product to make a few hundred bucks that day, right? And so it's helpful to recognize what compartment are we in with other people? So yeah, so to me, that's been kind of helpful. And the Buddha talked a lot about disenchantment, waking up from enchantments, including sweet or even well-intended enchantments that are that are a little naive, a little childlike, a little innocent, a little yearning, you know, to have a just world when it's unjust and will and has been certainly in lots of areas. So that might be some change of mind for oneself. And sometimes it's progressive where you start to realize what you're dealing with. And you want to try to help that sink in, not be too quick to jump to a negative conclusion about who you're dealing with, but be prepared to when it, the evidence is pretty clear. For my kind of rule of thumb is, you know, I'm going to give us kind of a mathematical model for this a little bit, but my rule of thumb is they do it once. Huh? Notice it. Like, wow. You just start to feel that they're bullshitting you or they're hyping you or spinning or they're ducking they're not answering a question what so once you go eh, could be a one-off but you notice it two hmm hmm <laughs> hmm <laughs> right three times for sure you know and i think geometrically one is a point two points to find a line three points to find a plane and hmm or as Maya Angelou puts it, you know, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And then sometimes I'll test people. I'll, I'll push on it. I see it once. I kind of go, oh, sorry, did you know that? And then I'll see what they do. And if people blow me off or push back or try to punish me or, you know, you just feel their kind of bristly contempt uh, at that attempt on my part to repair. That's so if they do it once, it's a yellow flag. If they fight the attempt to repair and to reestablish trust, that's a red flag. And almost always, if they're going to do that once, they'll do it again. And that's not a trustworthy person, certainly inside the frame of that compartment. Okay, I've got to keep going, but is that okay, Jack? Anything yes, else? Very helpful. Yeah. All right, I better wrap up, uh, but a couple more people. If you turn on your camera too, and you have your hand raised, then it's easier for me to call on you and see you. I don't see who you are. Okay, Peter, you you won the race for uh, camera. Uh, what's, what's, so I've unmuted you, Peter. You Now you have to unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? There you are, Peter. Can you turn up your volume? I can't hear you. Peter, how about we see if we can get your, you see if you can get your microphone working and I'll, I'll respond to somebody else right now, okay? Okay. Oh, I can hear you, Peter, excellent. Oh. Again, Peter? Okay. Yep, you're coming through. Tell you what, Peter, put your question in the chat, okay? Put your question in the chat and I'll respond to it in the chat, all right? And meanwhile, I'll bounce out to iPhone USAB. All right, okay, Peter? So iPhone USAB, that's your name. I've asked to unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Great. Yes, I did. Great. Um, I find that there are certain people that I, I see on a regular basis um, and we, you know, we, we, other we people, see if, if you have your, if you're unmuted, mute yourself. Yeah. Okay, great. Am I? Okay. I'm sorry. My clock is chiming. I'm sorry. Oh, that's you. Okay. Um, <laughs> no worries. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, it just as an example, one of my relatives, we get together and, um, He's a, a nice person, you know, he has good qualities, but he will just talk into your face of a certain view and it, there's no way that you can, you can't even interact with him. It just comes at you. you bet. So I don't One know if it's, if it's right to do it or not, but I, I've been 
practicing avoidance and just trying to avoid certain topics so that they don't come up and that he doesn't get into this mode. And I don't know if I should be doing that or not, but I, I find it, it's, it does work somewhat. I think that's wise and appropriate. Um, and again, we're talking about what we do inside our minds. So maybe what we change is we realize that don't send a duck to Eagle School. In other words, maybe what we change in our own mind is we start to but we start to budge, we shift our expectations about this other person. And we realize that, um, like I have a friend, uh, that when I see my friend, and this is a dear friend, I've known this, this man for a long, long time, wonderful person, it's almost entirely a one-way transmission. Uh, for an hour, he's talking for 58 out of 60 minutes mm-hmm. about himself, his adventures, or deeply interesting, his ideas, and maybe two minutes for me. And I kind of know that. And I've tried to budget, I've tried to shift it, but it doesn't shift. So I kind of, okay. And it's worth it once a year for me to hang out and, you know, get that 58 to transmission. And that, but that's, but I have a clear expectation. I understand what I'm, mm-hmm. I see, I see you, uh, you know, I, I recognize that and that can happen too. Okay, I, I do want to finish up in a minute. If so, is that okay? Uh, yes, that's fine. I, that that, that um, I can utilize that for sure. Yeah, and we just know, and we, like I, for me, there's like a rule of thumb. When I walk away from the interaction, how do I feel? Do I feel better or worse? <laughs> do I feel fed or drained? And some people, out of service and our own virtues, we we put up with it. We're there service, okay. We or we we're stuck. We can't get out of it. Okay, but in general, if it's a volitional, optional interaction, if the net of it, after skillful efforts on one's own part, if the net of it continues to be a lot of cost, few benefits, then we start reducing the size of that relationship and the frequency of those interactions and mm-hmm. their duration in our life. Uh, I want to say a little bit about, you know, what I said about Texas and, you know, renewables and that I, I see different comments coming in. Uh, I, I, I only know what I quickly heard on the news. And so I just want to say, but my point largely is clearly, I think there's a consensus, certainly, that the primary source of issues in Texas right now are not about renewable energy. And I think that is clear consensus there. So I'll leave, I'll leave that. And, and I'm open to changing my mind about that if it actually turns out that that's fundamentally wrong. Okay, I want to move on. Peter, did you get your quick question in? And then I'm going to zoom. Do to do Peter, no question in the chat. Okay. S- sorry, Peter, can you speak? Have you f- got that going, Peter? Alas. Technical ground. Uh, how now? Yeah, well, it's very spotty, okay, Peter. Great. The, um, I just wanted to say that your conversation with George was really enlightening because um, the entanglement is just the key word. And I find myself with folks who are very disingenuous suddenly yeah. thinking I have to fix them. Yeah. Which or fix their attitudes or whatever or thoughts. And I, I, I have to consciously work on entanglement because uh, I do it to me. Oh, and, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Good and my only other thought was um, a famous quote by a great mindfulness expert, Ian Fleming. Um, Once is coincidence, twice is happenstance, three times is enemy action. Yeah. And that's the rule. Yeah. I tend to be a little more tilted toward the two, but yeah, I'm cool. Uh, Definitely, if it's happenstance, beware enemy action. Maybe I'll leave it at that. That's very good. And it's good, Peter, too. And I think it's helpful to appreciate us that often it's good intentions or sweet longings in us that draw us into entanglements. Absolutely. And, uh, and, that, and I, I have my hand up on that. That's yeah, me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Last person uh, who's been hanging in there, Sophia uh, Paparodos. Hopefully I'm not mispronouncing that. I've asked to unmute you. You can turn on your camera, Sophia, if you're here. I'm here. Great. 
Okay, you're the last and not the least. Well, it was just simply a, about biolog biology. Yeah. Do some people just have that nervous system, born with that nervous system where they're rigid? Yes, there are, that's very clear. Uh, in the so-called big five theory of personality, there's openness as a dimension and openness at one end and rigidity at the other. And probably, you know, at least a third, if not half on average of what places people on these ranges, these spectrums is innate, biological, you know, heritable, genetically rooted factors. So yeah, people vary. And I think that some people are just too open. They're like the will of the wind. You know, you well, can't, not anymore. Hand, but <laughs> others can be too rigid the other way. So I think it's kind of helpful uh -huh. too. And also depending on situations in certain situations, a certain rigidity, like people in rural areas tend to be more conservative, especially in centuries past, because the consequences of a mistake were catastrophic. All right, so they tended to be more tradition bound and more rigid because if they got it wrong in how they planted their crops in April, they'd be starving mm. in December. Wow, that's incredible. That's an interesting insight. I didn't yeah. know why people were so conservative yeah. that were that, in rural areas. That's one of the reasons that people have talked about anthropologically and so forth and, and okay. all that. But anyway, but yeah, you're right. People, um, you know, and their situations can shape it. So for me, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is I'll finish here on this point, personal practice and agency and freedom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And depending on our situation, mm -hmm. grounded mm -hmm. in, clear, in clear recognition of what we're dealing with outside us, around us and inside us, uh, we go, you know, huh, where would it be helpful to not change our, my mind? Because I do see it correctly, or I, you know, I do recognize Mara, you know, I, I see people with good faith or bad faith, you know, <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand, where would it be helpful for me to change my mind? So you might want to you ask yourself in the discussion, if you stick around, you can be in a breakout group oh. and talk about it. Where might it be helpful to change your mind? And, and also this week and next week, I'll get more into depth. Yeah, Sophia, what were you going to say there? Well, I used to think everybody was like me. I'm Which glad you've changed your mind about that. <laughs> I, it, I have. I definitely have. I, I really have. Uh, but I used to think that whatever I was capable of, other people would be capable of as well. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in the 60s. Everything was nurture, nurture, nurture. And yeah. I have a heck of a, a lot of respect for nature now. Yeah. It's not just what you learn. It's also what you're born with. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's really good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's just let this sink in. Uh, if you're still here in a few minutes, Tom will sort you into breakout groups in Zoom. You don't need to stick around. Well, we usually have 80 or more people, maybe tonight, especially a lot of people, because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, and these are breakout groups of roughly four people each. Uh, you're, they're very optional. We ask that you make sure that everybody has about equal time to talk. I'll bounce and go get some dinner, and I'll see you next week. We'll pick up the thread of this topic changing your mind. And I'll leave you, if I can, with this quotation from Southeast Asia, know your mind, shape your mind, free your mind. And that's what I'm going to really explore next week. Know the mind, shape the mind, free the mind. That's what we can talk, talk about next week. So let's just sort of sit for, you know, a few breaths, let this sink in. And may you and I and all beings develop a mind that is malleable and wieldy, as the Buddha taught.